Hi, my name is Lillian Dolker. I'm one of the attending physicians in internal medicine here at Highland Hospital. Today we're going to be discussing how to approach stroke. I'd like to start this presentation by giving a few case scenarios of patients we have actually seen here in our hospital in just the last few months alone. An 84-year-old female presented to the emergency room with left-sided weakness and numbness. She was found to have a massive ischemic stroke. After receiving appropriate therapy, she was discharged to a rehabilitation facility. On the flip side, a 63-year-old male was brought in by ambulance after he was found altered at home. He was found to have a hemorrhagic stroke, and despite medical intervention, he unfortunately passed away. A 34-year-old female was admitted for lupus flare, who developed acute onset right-sided leg weakness, was found to have an embolic stroke, and was later discharged to a rehabilitation facility. And the last case is someone who hits home for me, as this was a patient I took care of on my service. He was a 55-year-old male who was admitted for cardiac risk stratification, who was found altered by his nurse in his room. He was found to have a massive ischemic stroke and received TPA, who later underwent hemorrhagic transformation. Unfortunately, we had to withdraw care on this patient. As you can see, there is a wide range of stroke patients we see here in the ER and the inpatient side. It is important to know that stroke is the fourth leading cause of death and the leading cause of disability in our country. As future patient care providers, it is important for you to know how to manage strokes as your actions have a direct impact on the outcomes of our stroke patients. I know that this sounds like an undaunting responsibility. However, I hope that by the end of this presentation, you would have known what a transient ischemic attack is and why it is important to know this, what is stroke and its different subtypes, how to diagnose stroke, and manage acute stroke in the hospital setting. Hopefully you all will be more comfortable once you have heard this presentation. So transient ischemic attack is focal neurological symptoms resulting from brain, retinal, or spinal cord ischemia. It is interesting to note that there's actually an absence of infarction on neuroimaging. And it is important to note that it is independent of symptom duration. This is interesting because prior definitions have described TIAs as symptoms lasting less than 24 hours, but this time restriction in the new definition has been removed. It is important to identify a TIA because it is a neurologic emergency. This is because patients who have had a TIA have a 48-hour and a 90-day increased risk of stroke. It would definitely be nice to be able to predict who is at a higher level of having a stroke. Fortunately, there are clinical scales to help us risk stratify these patients. The score I think we are all familiar with is the ABCD2 score. However, our hospital has adopted the ABCD3I score. So let's talk about that a little. The ABCD3I score is very similar to the ABCD2 score in that they both account for age, blood pressure, clinical features, duration of symptoms, and diabetes. A score of three or more on either score warrants admission. The main difference between these two scores is that the ABCD3I score takes into account two things, dual TIA, which is two TIA events within seven days, and imaging, that is 50% stenosis of the ipsilateral internal carotid artery and the presence of hyperintensity on diffusion-weighted MRI. The advantage of the stroke Sorry, the advantage of this score is that it improved the predictive ability of not only short-term, but also long-term occurrence of stroke after a TIA. So finally, let's talk about stroke, its types, and management pearls. Stroke is a sudden onset of focal neurological impairment that can be described to a specific location in the brain, retina, or spinal cord. The first type is hemorrhagic stroke, which is further subdivided into intracranial hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Intracranial hemorrhage results when a weakened or diseased blood vessel ruptures, resulting in spilling of blood into the brain. Subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs when an aneurysm bursts in the subarachnoid space, creating a pressure effect on the brain tissue. The second type is the ischemic stroke, which can be further subdivided into thrombotic, embolic, 
lacunar, and cryptogenic strokes. Ischemic strokes occur when a blood clot or atherosclerotic plaque stops blood flow to an area of the brain resulting in ischemia. It is important to make the distinction between hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke because the cornerstone of treatment in select patients with ischemic stroke is giving IV thrombolytics within three hours of onset of symptoms. Mind you, we do not give IV thrombolytics in patients who have had a hemorrhagic stroke. So how do we diagnose stroke? The mnemonic used for identifying the signs of stroke is B fast. B for imbalance on the feet, E for loss of vision in one or both eyes, F for facial asymmetry, A for weakness in arms or legs, S for problems with speech, and T for time. Timely recognition and intervention is the backbone of stroke therapy. In fact, the 2018 stroke guidelines outline a very specific time requirement for stroke treatment. These include physician evaluation to be done within 10 minutes, a CT head non-contrast to be done within 20 minutes, radiologic interpretation of the CT to be done within 45 minutes, thrombolytic administration to be done within 60 minutes, and ER to inpatient admission to be done within 180 minutes. This may appear tight, but the fastest time clocked within Alameda Health System from door to TPA administration was 26 minutes. Not bad. A complete neurologic examination is warranted in all patients with suspected stroke. It is important to ascertain when the patient was last normal because it needs to be clearly established that onset of symptoms began less than three hours before giving TPA. In the acute stroke setting, where time is of the essence, validated scales have been developed for measuring neurologic impairment, which can be rapidly performed by any healthcare provider. The most commonly used scale and the one we have adopted at our hospital is the NIH stroke scale. I would encourage all of you to review this on your own time. Eventually, we will require everyone to get NIH SS certified. The score is important because it helps guide treatment. For example, a score of more than 25 excludes a patient from receiving TPA versus a patient who scores less than three may actually benefit from dual antiplatelet therapy. But more importantly, it allows us to objectively quantify and succinctly communicate the impairment caused by a stroke. So let's talk about stroke management in the initial 45 minutes. For any situation, not just stroke, always ensure that the patient is hemodynamically stable and not in respiratory distress. Once this has been established, as described earlier, perform neurologic examination and document your NIH stroke score. Per the stroke guidelines, a physician should evaluate the patient in 10 minutes, followed by a head CT in 20 minutes, and CT interpreted within 45 minutes. While the patient is getting the CT, place the patient on telemetry and call the neurologist. Once the patient is back from his CT, ensure that he has had an 18 peripheral IV in place for therapy administration. STAT labs should include a CBC, a basic metabolic panel, and a coagulation profile, primarily PT, PTT, and INR. Also, stroke order sets are available for you guys to use. There are currently three sets, one for hemorrhagic stroke, one for ischemic stroke with TPA, and one for ischemic stroke without TPA. So let's review some pearls of each of these order sets. Pearls for acute ischemic stroke management with alteplase. All patient must be in the ICU. Mind you, TPA is to be pushed only after reviewing inclusion and exclusion criteria with the neurologist. Please do not give any thrombotic therapy for the first 24 hours. I'm sorry, no antithrombotic therapy, that is. The blood pressure goal for these patients is a systolic blood pressure of less than 185 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic blood pressure of less than 110 millimeters of mercury. Everyone should note that both these factors should be met. It is not one or the other. Do not use nifedipine or hydralazine as it can actually worsen ischemia. The goal blood glucose level should be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Something to remember is that any change in neurologic status should warrant a STAT head CT. 
Also, giving IV alteplase does have some side effects, so the two things we need you to monitor for are orolingual angioedema and intracranial bleed. Let's review the pearls of acute ischemic stroke management without alteplase. All patients should be monitored on telemetry for at least 72 hours. This is primarily because we are monitoring for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, as this is an independent risk factor for stroke. Also, 30% of patients actually do develop cardiac arrhythmias in the first 72 hours of having a stroke. All patients should receive aspirin, Plavix, or Agrinox. Dual antiplatelet therapy has actually been shown to increase bleeding risk. So all you really need to do is start the patient on aspirin, Plavix, or Agrinox. All patients should receive statin therapy. And I've sure, I'm sure all of you must have heard that patients should be allowed permissive hypertension in the first 24 hours. That is, you don't want to drop their blood pressures too quickly or too much, otherwise you can actually worsen the underlying ischemia. Once again, do not use nifedipine or hydralazine and get that STAT head CT for any worsening in neurologic status. Pearls of acute hemorrhagic stroke management. Patients should not be given antithrombotic therapy for 48 hours. The gold systolic blood pressure is less than 140 millimeters of mercury and the diastolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury. Once again, the gold blood glucose level is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. If the patient has been on any anticoagulants, this needs to be reversed. For example, if the patient came in on Coumadin, consider giving vitamin K and FFP. Once again, do not use nifedipine or hydralazine and get that STAT CT head if you're worried. So what is a post-acute care management of these patients? Diagnostic tests help make the diagnosis and guide treatment plans, such as an MRI brain without contrast, if not done already, an MRA or CT angiogram of the head and neck, an echocardiogram. All patients should have a bedside evaluation conducted by their nurse. If they fail, be sure to order a formal swallow evaluation. All patients require an evaluation by the physical and occupational therapists. Patients who smoke require counseling as smoking is an independent risk factor for stroke. And last but not least, along with stroke education, don't forget to document your discharge NIH stroke score. We are currently doing several projects here at Highland to improve stroke care for our patients. These include revision of the stroke order sets, making a brain alert policy, and getting everybody NI stroke certified. I hope you have enjoyed this talk, and I'm sure you all will feel more confident in managing our stroke patients after this. Thank you.